Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is comparative statics without derivatives. I cover comparative statics in Lesson 3.4 of Game Theory 101, the complete textbook. Check the video description for more information about that. But I don't actually cover comparative statics without derivatives in that book. This lecture is essentially a stopgap measure. If you really want to do game theory, you need to know how to use derivatives. But if you don't, and you're still curious to work with these models, at least in the short term, and want to be able to do something without using derivatives, this lecture will tell you how to conduct comparative statics without them. And I'll explain a little bit more at the end about why this method is inferior to what you can do if you know how to use derivatives. So if you'll think back to the last lecture when we were originally introducing comparative statics, the problem that we were looking at is that we had solved a penalty kick game and we know that in equilibrium, the striker kicks to the left with probability 1 over 1 plus x, where x represents his accuracy to the right side. And we're curious about what happens to that equilibrium probability as the accuracy changes. So as the striker gets more accurate to the right side, what happens to the probability that he kicks left? And imagine that we think that increasing x in this manner decreases that probability but we don't know how to use derivatives. If we knew how to use derivatives, we could simply use the method that we talked about in the last lecture and be done with it. But if we don't know how to use derivatives, what do we do? Well, the alternative is to use something known as the epsilon method. And the epsilon method works as follows. We're going to consider two cases. One is the original case where the striker's accuracy was simply x. x, again, is that accuracy to the right side. And another where his accuracy is x plus epsilon where epsilon is some value greater than zero, and we usually think of epsilon as a very, very, very small value. So it's just slightly positive. And what this epsilon is doing is reflecting an increase in x. So in the original case, his accuracy was just x to the right side, and in the second case, his accuracy becomes x plus epsilon. So he's slightly more accurate to the right side in the second case as compared to the first case. And if we look at the element of interest in both of these cases, one where the accuracy is x and one where the accuracy is x plus epsilon, and we can show that one of those values is greater than the other, then we've established the relationship. So for example, imagine that we thought that increasing the accuracy to the right side decreased the probability that the striker was kicking to the left side. Then the calculation that we would want to look at is as follows. We would start off with that first line. We would think about the first case where the accuracy is just x and write down the probability of kicking to the left as 1 over 1 plus x. And if we thought that increasing the accuracy to the right side would decrease the probability that he kicks to the left side, we would then say that that original value, 1 over 1 plus x, is greater than what happens when we increase the accuracy to the right side and that probability becomes 1 over 1 plus x plus epsilon. So if we can somehow rearrange this algebraically to show that this inequality is true, then we would have established the relationship where increasing accuracy to the right side decreases the probability that the striker kicks to the left side. And of course, I've already done the algebra on the screen there. We know that both of those numerators, rather both of those denominators, are strictly positive. So we can multiply both sides by those denominators. And that leaves us with 1 plus x plus epsilon is greater than 1 plus x. And of course, 1 plus x is the same on both sides, so those cancel out. And we're left with just epsilon is greater than 0. And we know that that's true. Remember previously, we defined epsilon as some relatively small value that is greater than zero. So if we have the last line of the proof saying epsilon is greater than zero, we have successfully accomplished what we set out to do. We originally hypothesized that the accuracy, uh, if the accuracy to the right side is just x, that the probability of kicking to the left would be greater than what happens when the accuracy becomes x plus epsilon. And we looked at the inequality, which would say that that is true. And we've demonstrated that, that inequality does in fact hold. 1 over 1 plus x is greater than 1 over 1 plus x plus epsilon. So that's it on how you would conduct a comparative static without derivatives. Of course, there are some nuances here, which I haven't quite got into. And so I want to cover that. I want to talk about why you need to be careful when you're using this epsilon method. 
So for example, one thing that you need to be worried about is that if you guess the original relationship incorrectly, you might get to a statement that is flat out wrong. So for example, imagine that you hypothesized wrongly, but you didn't know that at the time. You just hypothesized inadvertently that if the accuracy to the right side is increasing, so the accuracy to the right side is x plus epsilon, that this results in a higher probability of kicking to the left. And if that's what you guessed originally, if that was what your original hypothesis was, you would have written down that 1 over 1 plus x is less than 1 over 1 plus x plus epsilon. And if you worked through the algebra, you would have eventually reached a statement that said epsilon is less than zero. But of course, that's false. We know that epsilon is some strictly positive value, not some strictly negative value. So if you were to make this sort of mistake while conducting the epsilon method, this is actually relatively easy to resolve. All it means, if that last line is telling you something that is 100% false, all that means is that you need to flip your original hypothesis. If you thought that increasing x was going to result in an increase in that element of interest, that's the inequality that you would have written down on that first line, but that turned out to be wrong, all you need to do is go back with an eraser, if you were doing this with pencil, and flip the inequality around. Rather than starting out with a less than, you start off with a greater than, and then that eventually gets you to the last line where epsilon is greater than zero, like we saw in the previous case, and we know that that's right. So if you're conducting the epsilon method and you get to a final statement that is a false conclusion, simple solution, just go back and rearrange or flip the inequalities. Another problem that you might encounter is situations where you are subtracting by that parameter of interest x. So imagine the element of interest wasn't 1 over 1 plus x, but rather 1 over 1 minus x. Here is not how you want to do it. If we add epsilon to x and we don't distribute the negation, we are doing the exact opposite of what we want to do. In the case on the left, we have 1 over 1 minus x. In the case on the right, we have 1 over 1 minus x plus epsilon. But if we're increasing the value of x, what we should be doing is decreasing the overall amount that uh, we are going to have in the denominator. We should be subtracting by a larger amount. And in that case on the right, on the right side of the inequality, by adding epsilon instead of adding it inside of a parentheses, which I'll show you in a second, we are effectively making x a smaller amount as compared to what would happen if we put parentheses around the x. Because what we're trying to do with this epsilon method is think about what happens when we make x bigger. And so whatever x is being manipulated by, in this case, it's a subtraction, a negation, the epsilon also needs to go through with that, which is why in the previous case, if we go back a few slides here, you'll notice that in this original calculation, I actually put what might be perceived as an unnecessary set of parentheses around x plus epsilon. And the reason I did that was precisely for this case down here, if we go back to the slide that we were just looking at, where we need to have x and epsilon both be subtracted. So whenever you're adding epsilon to that parameter that you're trying to manipulate, make sure you're thinking about this as the parameter as a whole, rather than just adding an epsilon next to wherever the x value was. Now finally, I want to talk about what the problem is with using this method, this epsilon method, to conduct comparative statics. It might be the case that an effect that you're interested in is non-monotonic. So the effect or the element of interest might be increasing for some portion of the parameter space and then decreasing after that. So I have a small little graph on the bottom right to reflect this. Here, this element of interest is increasing up until 2, and then after that, it's starting to decrease again. And if you are using the epsilon method, you miss out on these sorts of non-monotonic effects. And while we haven't actually encountered a non-monotonic effect like this, in any of the simple games that we've looked at so far, when you start conducting or building more complicated models, you will start oftentimes seeing these non-monotonic effects. And derivatives will help you pick up on these sorts of things, whereas the epsilon method is really weak at that. Uh, another way that the epsilon method is not as good as the derivative method is that we might be curious about the rate at which something is increasing. So all the epsilon method tells us is whether something is increasing or decreasing. It doesn't tell us about how fast it's increasing or how fast it's decreasing. 
And with the way something is increasing or decreasing might depend on the other parameters in the game. And that's information that's lost by using the epsilon method, which is something that you can get at using derivatives. So that's why we strictly prefer using the derivative method wherever we can. In fact, I can only think of maybe one or two times in my entire career where I thought that it would actually be a good, a good idea to use the epsilon method. More or less, we are always using the derivative method, which is why it's very important to know how to use derivatives uh, if you want to be a serious game theorist. But if you don't know how to use derivatives, that can be fine in the short term. You can use this epsilon method to get at what you need to figure out for these comparative statics, at least in simpler models. So go ahead and use it. But again, if you don't know how to use derivatives, you really ultimately need to start learning uh, that. So uh, good luck in those calculus classes. All right, that wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you next time. Take care.